Hello, you're listening to Corpus Cast, the podcast all about corpus linguistics and what it can do for society. Each episode, we'll explore how the study of language in large corpora is used to tackle challenges in the world relating to education, health and technology, among many others. So sit back, relax, and uh, join us as we discover the ways in which corpus linguistics is shaping the future of the study of language. I'm your host, Robbie Love, and I'm a corpus linguist at Aston University. Now, in today's episode, we'll be reflecting on the role of linguistics in corpus linguistics. Uh, while it may be widely agreed that corpus linguistics is a way of studying language, of course, um, there is a great deal of variation in terms of how far removed the analyst may be uh, from the actual original language usage. Uh, and developments in the field in the direction of so-called big data and uh, seemingly increasingly sophisticated st statistical approaches could be said to uh, potentially open the door for research that is heavy on the number crunching and, and maybe a bit light on linguistic theory. Now, the extent to which this is a problem is an interesting question in and of itself, and the uh, centrality of linguistics in corpus linguistics is something that my guests today have considered deeply. Uh, for example, in their book, Doing Linguistics with a Corpus, Methodological Considerations for the Everyday User. Uh, now, two of the authors of this book are joining me today, and they are Dr. Jesse Egbert and Dr. Tova Larson from Northern Arizona University. Jesse Egbert is Associate Professor of Applied Linguistics at Northern Arizona University. He specializes in the use of corpus linguistic methods to explore lexical and uh, grammatical variation with a focus on online registers and the language of the law. He's also interested in linguistic research methods, including corpus design and representativeness, methodological triangulation, and statistical analysis. He is a founder and general editor of the international scholarly journal Register Studies, technical strand editor for Cambridge Elements in Corpus Linguistics, and series co-editor for Routledge's Advances in Corpus Linguistics series. Uh, Tova Larson is Assistant Professor of Applied Linguistics at NAU, and she specializes in Corpus Linguistics, learner corpus research, register variation, uh, and research methods, and is also leading a project on ethics, investigating questionable research practices in quantitative humanities research. So both my guests, I'm sure, have an awful lot to say about the role of linguistics in corpus linguistics. And so I'll be asking them all about this, as well as hearing about some of their current research projects and the big new corpus uh, that they're building at the moment, which is uh, very exciting indeed. So without further ado, I'm very excited to welcome to Corpus Cast Jesse Egbert and Tobe Larson, who are joining us together in the same room uh, at Northern Arizona University. So hello both. Thank you so much for coming on. It's great to see you. Thank you so much for having us. Great being here. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. We're excited. Thanks so much for, for coming on. I know it's a little bit early in the morning uh, for you joining us for, for this recording as well. So I very, very much appreciate you uh, coming on and your time. Um, let's get to it then. Uh, I'm going to start with a question that I always start with for, for all of my guests uh, on Corpus Cast. Um, and you're very welcome to, to both uh, give your own uh, interpretations of these answers uh, in turn. Um, so, uh, Jesse, let's start with you. What does Corpus Linguistics mean to you? That's a big question. Um, yeah. A lot of thoughts come to mind. Uh, I, I like to think of Corpus linguistics as a method for getting insights into language that we can't get any other way. It gives us the chance to sort of be a fly on the wall as natural language is happening without us as researchers tampering at all with what's happening. Um, so many other methodologies raise questions about the observer's paradox and what influence the researcher may have had. And they're, they're powerful methods, but we always have this lingering question about the role of the observer. And corpus linguistics is exciting because most of the time, corpora were collected naturally. Authentic language emerges, is recorded, is studied after the fact, and 
it's exciting to be able to look at that, see patterns of variation and change over time. And, and uh, I think we're only beginning to fully understand how much we can learn through this approach. And so that's, you know, some of my ideas about why corpus linguistics is so exciting. And, and how would you uh, define uh, corpus linguistics in, in, in your own view, Tove, as well? Similar, or do you have a slightly different uh, spin on things? Uh, no, very similar, I would say. Um, and just, yeah, emphasizing the, the focus on authentic language use, um, using corpus methods, corpora. So not much to add to that. Well, it maybe is no surprise that you have a similar worldview on this uh, perspective since you work worked together so much in, in, in recent years. Um, I want to hear uh, again from, from both of you about, you know, how you uh, came to be in the, the positions that you have now, the interests that you have in corpus linguistics, but also more broadly your, uh, your academic uh, journey so far. So um, Jesse, uh, again, we'll, we'll, we'll start with you. Um, what does your, your, your background look like, your, your path to uh, your, your current uh, uh, role that you have? Yeah, another big question, but in a nutshell, I studied linguistics at Brigham Young University and worked with Mark Davies there, um, and he introduced me to corpus linguistics. I fell in love with the methodology and was excited about it, and so chose to come to Northern Arizona University for graduate school to work with people like Doug Biber and Randy Ruppin. Um, I did my master's and PhD here at Northern Arizona University and spent the whole time working with uh, both Doug and Randy and uh, you know years of working with Doug starting at that time until now has had a huge influence on me. Um, you know, people often think that Doug and I agree on everything because we publish a lot together and by the time our thoughts, our shared thoughts, see the light of day, we agree. What they don't see behind the scenes is that we always have healthy debates on a range of topics and issues. I love that Doug is open to hearing all sorts of different perspectives um, from his students and, and we've debated for years big questions related to register and methods and corpus linguistics and I think that sort of back and forth has really helped me mature as a scholar. So um, yeah, that's sort of part of my academic journey. And then I taught at BYU for a couple of years after graduation, and then NAU was calling me back home. And so I <laughs> took a job here and plan to stay here forever. So I, I, I love the idea of uh, you and uh, Doug Biber, you know, <laughs> violently bickering uh, while, while working on, on, on every paper. Um, and then, and then this, this lovely sort of unified view comes out and everybody thinks that you agreed on everything all along. That's, that's great. <laughs> um, so, uh, same, same question for you. Uh, you, I think you joined, uh, Northern Arizona a little bit more recently. Um, uh, so how did you, uh, come to be working, uh, as a, a colleague of, of Jesse and, and, and others at NAU? Yeah, no, it took me slightly longer to get here. Um, and I'm very happy to be here. Now, um, I started my journey at Stockholm University in Sweden. Um, I was in the teaching training program thinking that I was going to be a high school teacher of English and math. Um, and I almost got in. So in, in Sweden, you study linguistics, uh, literature, and pedagogy, didactics. Um, and I almost went into the, lingu um, the literature um, side of things. Um, so, but I'm very happy I, I didn't in the end. Um, nothing was literature, but I, I love linguistics. Um, and so, yeah, I did my undergrad at Stockholm University, my master's to Stockholm University, and then I realized that corpus linguistics is really what I want to do. And so I did my um, PhD at Uppsala University, which is the um, kind of the, the center of corpus linguistics in Sweden. Um, and uh, after that, uh, I was fortunate enough to get some postdocs, spend time at UC Levan in Belgium. Um, working with all the, the learner corpus people there, so Michael Lipako, Gaetanel Jutkan, uh, Sylvain Granger, among others. And um, after that, I came to um, to NEU as a postdoc for uh, some time first, and I uh, got to know people here and got to see how things worked here and how 
amazing the students are and, and all that. So, um, and then a position opened up and I felt that this is my, my academic home and now my, my actual home. So I'm um, very fortunate to, to get to, to stay here, uh, hopefully long-term, assuming I get tenured. <laughs> Oh well, f- fingers crossed indeed uh, for for that. Um, and uh, you know, you you've both, of, as you've already mentioned, worked with with you know a, a range of of really uh, inspiration and in, incredible researchers as well. Um, I'm very curious to, to sort of get more into uh, one example of that, which is uh, the book that I mentioned you published with with Doug Biber. Uh, doing linguistics with a corpus. I, I I think I'm not actually allowed to call it a book. They they like it's an element it's, it's not a book they, i know they're very strict on that so i, I apologize for but no, it's a cambridge element um of doing linguistics with a corpus um and you you have an accompanying uh website you have a blog uh with, by the same name um and clearly i i think for, for for some people that sort of framing it in that way and, and maybe it was sort of intentionally provocative i suppose because corpus linguistics fine doing linguistics with a corpus you know, you might, if you don't know otherwise, think, well, isn't that just the same thing? What's the difference? But clearly, you 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 have uh, an angle um, uh, that you're that you're arguing for. So, what is the difference to start with between uh, corpus linguistics and doing linguistics with a corpus? Um, I don't know. Maybe Jesse, you 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 want to start, and we'll we'll go from that. Yeah, I I can take a stab at it. I think. Um what we were trying to do is bring linguistics to center stage there, as you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, there's a wide range of approaches using corpus linguistic methods. And some of them are deeply rooted in linguistic analysis. It's using a corpus, but the focus is to answer purely linguistic questions. And that, that's one end of the spectrum. And then you can go clear to the other end of a spectrum. And corpora could be thought of as mere databases to do fun searches to learn about you know, neat patterns with uh, words. And as I mentioned in an er- response to an earlier question, corpora make all of those things possible. Um, our angle is that... Uh, linguistics can be approached in a unique way using corpora and corpus linguistics. And if we're not careful as researchers, we may intend to answer linguistic research questions, but get um, sidetracked or distracted by the methods that corpus linguistics allows us to use or the statistics that we can use to analyze our data. And, And in the end, actually not do a very good job of answering those linguistic questions we started with. And so it, it's, it's not so much trying to make a distinction between two different subfields as it is trying to emphasize linguistics, shine a spotlight on it, and let the corpus and corpus linguistics um, play a supporting role. We use that in order to answer the linguistic questions that we have. And uh, for many people who have been doing corpus linguistics for a long time, this is how they've always thought of things. Corpus linguistics has always been a method for learning yeah. about language. Um, but now that we have corpora being used all over for many different things, we think it's useful to try to remind researchers that these distractions exist and that if we're not careful, as we add layers of distance away from the actual language data um, and, and, and run the risk of not finding our way back to the language data and the questions that we had, uh, we may end up missing opportunities to answer those important questions. And so it's maybe, maybe symbolic of recentering linguistics in the corpus linguistic enterprise for people that, that care a lot about that. I see. I see. Um, uh, and Tova, from 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 your perspective, um, how did you sort of how how did this this idea to to come together with Jesse and also as mentioned uh, Doug um, to to come together on on this issue? Was it the case that sort of individually the three of you were sort of all sort of thinking the same things and and sort of realizing you all had similar kind of 
uh, maybe concerns is a word. I, I don't want to use too strong a word, but you know, concerns around uh, the way that the methods are are being used sometimes. Or tell us a bit more about how how you came together and and what were those kind of initial discussions like of sort of fleshing out the 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 arguments that 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 you make in in the in the element. Uh, <laughs> get the right terminology. Yes. <laughs> Sure, yeah, no, and actually that was kind of the case that we realized when we talked about this that we had been, all three of us had been thinking about this in very similar ways, and um, so just practically speaking, we, we came together and, and said, okay, I, let's collaborate on something, and, and what do we all, uh, what interest do we share, and, and one of them is is this interest in, in research methodology and corpus linguistics and thinking about the field and so on, but I think um, at a more general level, we all were thinking about the future of corpus linguistics. And I think the element is very much about, it's almost a, this philosophical question of, of where do we want the field to, to be heading and what do we think, um, and by we currently, the three of us, but, but as a field at large too, um, what, what do we want the field to look like in the future and what do, what, where do we want the emphasis to, to lie? And our answer to that, as, as Jesse already um, talked about a bit, is, is that we, we believe so strongly that uh, linguistics needs to um, take center stage here and that um, there's so much else that can come in and, and um, just take focus away from linguistics. And we're, we're hoping with this and with the blog and uh, with some other publications to try to really champion <laughs> linguistics and there are so many people who do this so well and, and it's just not about, you know, we, we tell the field that everyone's wrong or anything like that. Um, this is more about thinking about the future, thinking about the future of the field um, and where we want to um, be heading. Yeah, it, it, it's, it, I'm glad that you said that actually because, um, you know, there, there's a phrase that I, I noticed on the, uh, on the blog, which may be like a, a tagline, if you will, keeping the linguistics and corpus linguistics and maybe some, you know, some, someone in the field might sort of come across the blog, for example, and feel like, you know, oh, they're, they're telling me I'm, I'm getting it all wrong and I need to do, you know, but this, that's, as you said, that's not the, that's not the, the purpose. And, and, and maybe, maybe there's a distinction to be made between corpus linguists who, linguists who've been using corpora for quite a long time anyway, and then more recent developments in the field where these these methods are becoming more widely used well beyond uh linguistics and it, i guess that's the kind of sort of side that where you're trying to encourage those who have gotten into corpus stuff without having a background in linguistics so much is that is that kind of the the area that you're you're more targeting i suppose i would say not not really the element is for, for everyone. Really? We, one of the main benefits of being involved in this project for me has been that it is a constant reminder to me that yeah. even researchers with advanced knowledge of the field and a passion for linguistic questions can get sidetracked and distracted. Um, mm. You know, there's this dizzying array of methodological approaches, decisions we have to make about corpus design, and um, and often those things pull us away from the language and we finish the paper and submit it for publication without ever finding our way back. Um, it, it, you know, if anyone feels like our goal is to be critical of others, they only need to pick up the element to learn that all of our examples of, of sort of falling short come from our own work. We, we've looked back on previous publications and tried to think about times where we missed opportunities to really get into the language because of some of these issues. And so I think I like to think that anybody can benefit from pausing and reflecting on, you know, what is the role of the corpus and corpus linguistics in my research and what, it, you know, how central are my linguistic research questions? Um, how central is that language that's actually being produced and is it ever being replaced by numbers? Um, is it ever being analyzed in a way where we're not actually sure what we did to get those numbers? 
Um, all of these are risks we run when we're using a methodology that has a lot of moving parts and pieces and um, and a lot of choices about how far removed we'll be from the language when we actually look at it. And maybe adding to that, so our data is language, right? So the data is going to be or are going to be um, words and sentences, phrases and, and whatever we want to look at. It's not going to be numbers if you go, go like go all the way down. It's never going to be numbers, meaning that every time we add numbers to it, so we say, okay, the mean frequency of adverbs in this text was X and so on, we've abstracted away from language, right? Um, where other fields might actually start out from numbers. If you get survey data or something, then okay, the the mean is the you know the or at least the the uh, the numbers are the data there. Mm -hmm. um, and so here, so even a mean, you're we abstracted away from it, and then move up in terms of um, like fancy advanced stats and we're very far away from language all of a sudden and that may well be necessary because you know humans are can only do so much in terms of uh, number processing and and finding patterns and so on um, so but the the point or the the key here is to go back to language and uh, interpret the findings to be able to then um, uh, contribute to to linguistic theory, to to linguistic research questions, and so on. So that's I think what we're we're trying to really emphasize here. And again, like Jess said, um, we can <laughs> just go back to some of our uh, publications and say, "Well, you didn't do it there," then that's correct. We're hoping to to do better in the future. Um, but, but I think this awareness that we're gonna abstract away from language. Um, so how uh, how do we then? Make sure to return to it, and you know, give corpus examples and um, analyze the the linguistic findings, not just the numeric findings. I I think that's a really good point, and and something that that I sometimes worry about, especially in the context of spoken corpora, talking about abstracting away from the original language. Everything you said applies equally, of course, to any corpus data, but uh, you know, the process of compiling the corpus data may already be abstracting and of course transcription is already a huge abstraction away on top of everything else you've just said and so um i think it's it is really important to 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 think about to think about these issues um because i you know if, if i'm analyzing a spoken corpus i can't necessarily ever go back all the way back to the original you know, I can't go back to the room where these people were having the conversation or to the room where the lecturer was giving a lecture or whatever the context is. I can only go as far back as the transcript. So the transcript better be, you know, pretty good. Um, um, and even a good transcript is missing so much of the original uh, context. So it is, it is. you're right, it is very important to think about these things. And um, you, I think you both have contributed Obviously, blog posts to the website. Tober, I think you've 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 done um, maybe uh, se several of them, and um, you've also both worked on publications which similarly take a, a, a sort of um, a step back, you know, more of a bird's eye view over over uh, you know the field to kind of comment on practices more broadly. Um, and I think uh, Jesse, you mentioned about, um, or maybe both of you have already mentioned about. Uh, reporting statistics um, potentially at the expense of finding room to uh, talk about examples from the the corpus state, for example. Tell us a bit more about um, the the work that that you that you've done on on the changing role of statistical reporting, I suppose, and um, and and how things have changed in recent years, and and whether that is um, to one extent is that a concern, I suppose. So I can maybe start a bit and then we can jump in whenever. Um, so I think that's one of the uh, starting points that for the the element and then later for the the corporate paper that we did, the the three of us, so um, with Dr. Biber too, um, where we had noticed this um, movement maybe away from language uh, toward more statistics. And just to make it clear that we're not against statistics uh, in any way, just that we would like to um, emphasize the, the importance of using minimally sufficient methods as opposed to the fanciest thing we can think of. Um, and so we'd noticed this trend, um, a supposed trend, and but we weren't sure if it was just you know us being old and grumpy already or if it was um, you know, an actual trend or some actual change. 
And so we set out to do the study that later uh, turned into the, the corporate paper um, where um, we, we checked to see, okay, has there been a change in the field? And yes, there has been a, a change in that um, there's more um, stats really now and, and maybe for, for good reason in many, in many ways. But the, what was a bit troubling with this was that it seemed to have come at the expense of linguistics. Um, where it, that doesn't have to be the case. We saw so many examples in our data where uh, people did, uh, this, the authors did such a good job of combining the two, of having really advanced stats for uh, that were called for given their research questions um, and still being able to to include a lot of linguistic analysis, like really in-depth in depth linguistic analysis, um, use or uh, include text examples and, and so on. So it definitely is possible to combine the two, but somehow as a field, it seems, based on our limited sample, that um, or somewhat limited sample at least, um, that we are moving away from from focusing on on language and and toward more uh, focus on on stats, and which again could be seen as as okay the field maturing and and becoming more um, advanced and so on. Um, but we still we are you know we're linguists we're not statisticians so. Uh, let's make sure that we, if we want to do, um, you know, advanced stats, that we also do advanced linguistics uh, research too, uh, uh, and combine the two. Could the is is there an argument maybe that that um, you know the 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 proliferation of uh, statistical approaches and as you said, you've observed more and more of this o over time in, in recent years of, of research in the field. You know it. Uh, if people are not so, uh, or if, or if some papers that you that you studied are, are not so explicitly doing the linguistic stuff, is that because maybe that some of these statistical approaches are already linguistically informed statistical approaches, and so some of that some of that thinking is already kind of covered off in the discussion of the statistical part, or it, it you know. And again, this is just just sort of a, a completely kind of naive question, I suppose, in terms of, um, you know, is is it is the distinction completely kind of discrete between the linguistic part and the statistics part, or some, and there seem to be some approaches that are statistical that seem to be not necessarily exclusive, but but mostly just used by linguists and not many others. And so, is it maybe inherently there is some linguistics there, at least in how those methods were, were developed, that would kind of maybe reassure you or us that, um, you know, it, it, linguistics is still there, even if maybe not so explicitly discussed sometimes. Sure. Um, and also, again, we're not saying that statistics is bad, you know. Mm. Um, no, of course. So, yeah, it's... It, you know, it's only an issue if the linguistics isn't there. Um, yeah. But um, so, yeah, I think there's definitely a range of, of methods that um, where you see a lot of emphasis on linguistics just kind of in the method itself and uh, really exciting developments uh, for sure. Um, so, so, yeah, so it's not it's not that we're against stats, but um, it's that we're, we're for linguistics, linguistics. And then a part of your question that's really interesting is, can we develop methods that are tailored to linguistic or corpus linguistic questions that will help with this problem before we even use the method. I, I think to some degree, I think it definitely helps to have thoughtful corpus linguists thinking about the right methods. Um, at the same time, though, I think as researchers, we always need to know exactly what it is the method we're using is doing. We should never take it for granted. Uh, I, you know, over the years, anytime I mentioned to Doug that I think we might use method X to analyze pattern Y, he, his first response is, okay, well, show me how the results, the quantitative results can be reconciled with real examples of language use. So if that method says there's more of X, show me in the corpus, in the text, that where there's more of that and, and how it's kind of manifesting itself with the actual language. And sometimes in doing that, we found that we're not learning what we think we are. Um, we give examples in the element of, um, you know, collocation analysis. And 
different approaches. You know, there are lots of methods for analyzing colicates and they give you different sets of colicates. Um, and then you can kind of take that a step further and ask, well, can I go into the texts and see these colicates happening in action with the node word? And often you find that it, the reasons behind why they're co-occurring wasn't what you thought. And I think just staying in touch with the language data and making sure you understand the methods that you're using is always going to be important. I, I've had conversations with Paul Baker about keyword analysis and, um, you know, there's been debates for years over the best statistical technique for identifying yeah. keywords. And many people have gone to Paul to say, Hey, I've got this new methodology. Um, what do you think? And he told me that, um, he has kind of a go-to, uh, set of corpora target and a reference corpus to, to check out new methods. And he knows he spent a, enough time with this language data. He knows what's in the text. He knows what should be coming out as key because he's so familiar with it and he'll run it and see what he thinks about the results and how they line up with his understanding of the actual language. And, um, I, I like that approach of, of never taking things for granted and always caring about what we're actually learning about language. Um, there's so many exciting methods and, um, and, and many of them are, are powerful. I think it's all about alignment with our research question and about making sure that we're in touch with what we're actually learning. It's not hard to find examples of times where that isn't the case. Um, even if, you know, we go back and look at our own research and sometimes it only takes a few minutes to confirm those things and, and you um, can be a lot more confident that you're actually learning what you think you are. And, you, you know, obviously, uh, Doug, uh, Biver has been, um, you know, very influential uh, in in a lot of your research work with you, as as mentioned on on this particular uh, publication. We've been talking about doing linguistics with with a corpus. Um, I do want to, of course, uh, ask a bit more sort of widely about um, some of your 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 research, recent research uh, projects, and um, and and it's already sort of really refreshing to to hear you both sort of reflecting on your your own. Uh, practice, um, which I, I totally agree is is a really really important thing to do. Um, of course, you know, uh, Doug Biber is is uh, widely associated in the field with with the study of register, and uh, both of you also uh, do lots of work in in this area. As mentioned, uh, Jesse, you established um, uh, the Register Studies Journal, um, so. Let's take that that kind of um, elementary approach to start with. For those who may not be familiar with this idea, um, what is register, and and what can it uh, what can it contribute towards uh, the study of the study of language? It's a big question, I know, but <laughs> if you have a, a a sort of go to definition, then this is the time to to bring it out. <laughs> the only challenge here will will be me not talking too much because I, I'm passionate <laughs> about register. Yeah. Um, so Doug Biber and I just recently published a paper in register studies on the, to the title is what is a register? And we're rethinking that question, uh, currently, um, a register is a culturally defined variety of language associated with a situation and with certain linguistic features. And so think of a text message or an email message or a phone call or a podcast interaction. Think of an academic research article. These are all registers. We have a name for them. They're recognized by the culture as being a variety of language and they have certain situational characteristics, you know, Texting your your mom has uh, different sort of considerations in the in the context than writing an academic paper for a, a journal and to publish. So um, those situational differences, it turns out, um, lead to linguistic differences. We use language differently when we're texting our mother than we do when we're writing an article, and that's because we're 
trying to match the language we use to the situation that we're in, and that's all functional. The, the exciting thing about register is it doesn't just vary just because humans are tremendously lazy. Um, or you might think of it as humans are tremendously efficient, <laughs> right? We don't want to do any more work when it comes to language than we need to. So when we change how we use language from one context to the next, there better be a good reason. Otherwise, it's more efficient to just keep doing the same thing. We change because it's functional. We have motivation to change because when you're texting your mother, you have certain, uh, you know, relationship considerations and, you know, uh, situational aspects of the interaction that are important for maintaining that social relationship that, that just aren't there when you're writing an academic article. You're not trying to connect with your readers at the same level in the same way. You don't have the same shared background knowledge. It isn't interactive anymore. So the functions are different and the language is going to be different as well. So kind of with all of that background, you, Doug Biber wrote a few years ago that register always matters. Um, it, it's, it's hard for me to think of features of any language that that won't ever vary from one register to another. It's always worth looking because so often, even with simple things like the definite article, the, in English, that mm -hmm. varies radically across spoken versus written registers. Um, so register variation is, is really important. And um, for people who are studying maybe different aspects of language and registers and their main focus, I think it's always worth thinking about how that focus might be different across registers. But for, for me, most of my research actually has register at the forefront. I'm trying to better understand how register varies, how it, um, how it functions in, in language use. So like I said, I could go on forever, but I'll stop there. <laughs> that was, uh, no, very comprehensive and, um, uh, absolutely, you know, you certainly convinced me that it's, uh, Register is at the heart of everything we do with, with language. Absolutely. Um, Tov, I, I, I want to ask you about uh, one one example of your own work uh, in register, sort of in a particular context of um, learner language, which I know is something that you that you are, are interested in. Um, uh, you're involved in uh, building the Swedish uh, Learner English Corpus, for, for example. Um, what do you... In terms of research activity in, in this area, I mean, we, we've already had some guests on talking about language education and uh, L2 acquisition, and there's, there seems to be an, an, an awful lot um, of activity in, in this, this area looking at uh, learner language, especially of English as, as, as the, the language being learned, so to speak. So um, where do you see things heading in this direction based on you know, the work that, that you yourself have done? Yeah, I yeah, a lot of interesting things happening in, in the field of, of learning or subfield of learning corpus research for sure. Um, I think just starting with register, so there's been um, quite a few papers recently uh, really showing how that matters in, in learning language as well. Um, for example, Lar Larissa Glenart has done some really important work there. Um, and uh, so now that we have established that, yes, it matters for, for learning language uh, as well, then we might want to think about more um, how you develop it as a, as a language learner, because when you start out with a language, so speak a little bit of French for having lived in Belgium for a bit, and I don't have great registered awareness in French, let me tell you, because um, my proficiency level just isn't good enough um, or high enough. And so when does it start? How do we kind of develop this awareness um, in a second language or a third language? Um, and then just in general, I think it is really interesting to see more studies on um, the the learner themselves. So we have all this research from neighboring fields like second language acquisition, uh, talking about these individual differences like motivation and ap language aptitude and so on. And I think the more we know about the the person who is producing these texts or, or this, uh, this spoken output and so on, uh, the more we can learn about their their process. So. There are a lot of people who do this kind of bridging of uh, bridging the gap between SLA and 
and elsewhere. And I think that could be done even more. Uh, Magali Pekor, for example, has worked on this quite a bit. Um, and and on the topic of just learning more about uh, about the person, uh, the, the Swedish Learner English Corpus, uh, like you mentioned, is this new corpus that uh, where Henrik Kothery, my, my colleague in Sweden, um, is leading that uh, where we try to to get at the question of, okay, so is it really only about what goes on in the classroom or could actually um, have maybe even more to do with or at least as much to do with what goes on outside the classroom. So the time that people spend, students spend um, gaming in English or watching YouTube in English and, and so on. So we're trying to get at that. And I think moving forward as a field um, or as, as people who are interested in, in learning language and L2 use, I think anything we can learn um, outside the, about what's going on outside the classroom would be helpful. Um, and anything we can learn about what's going on with with the person uh, themselves, I think, would also be helpful. Um, so, yeah, I'm I'm really excited about the future for for uh, for that subfield for sure. That sounds very exciting, actually. And um, yeah, I absolutely uh, sympathise with. Uh, I I did uh, French at school, and um, about as far as I ever got of learning about any register differences was that um, you know some things you could say. Uh, to the teacher and some things you could say to fellow students and there were different words for different people and that was about as far as I ever got so um, there there I am uh, <laughs> um, we as we start to wrap things up here you know speaking of building culture I I, I, I must ask uh, you both as you are both involved in um, a very exciting uh, project at the moment in partnership with uh, Lancaster University building Lana the uh, Lancaster, Northern Arizona uh, corpus of uh, American English and the, the, the Lana case being the, the spoken uh, part, um, which I know you are currently building um, and and there's uh, a lot of activity going on with, with your colleagues. Uh, I know, for instance, Lizzie Hanks um, is uh, running a, an amazing TikTok <laughs> account with uh, about 18,000 followers sharing or you know linguistic insights asking members of the team questions and and things so there's a, there's an awful lot of, of activity going on it sounds very exciting so obviously you know this is relatively early stages you're still building the corpus so I appreciate there probably isn't so much you can say at this stage but what can you say about how it's going so far are, are you enjoying the kind of um promotional uh, activities um are you involved with that or have you kind of just left that to lizzie to to get on with yeah there's there's a lot here so as you mentioned this is a project that we're working on in collaboration with lancaster university um tony mchenry uh is leading the project uh Vaslav is is involved and and many people on that side it's been a, a great collaboration we're able to benefit from everything that team learned, you being part of it, um, <laughs> everything that team learned while building the BNC 2014 and and try to um, use that to our benefit as we build uh, an American counterpart in a sense with, with Lana. Uh, Robbie, I, I can't help but feel like sometimes you're in your office smiling about the fact that your job in creating the BNC Spoken 2014 is finished and we're just <laughs> getting started because it's a tremendous <laughs> It's a huge undertaking. Um, it's fun, but it's also daunting to try to collect natural conversational speech from a huge number of people. Uh, recruiting is a challenge. Uh, getting people to follow through and submit is a challenge. The original idea behind the TikTok channel was to help with uh, recruiting participants. It's turned into so much more than that. Um, I think one of Lizzie's videos has almost a million views now. Um, wow, and it, so it's been great because it's both an exciting outlet for linguistics and and corpus linguistics, but it it's also helped a lot with recruiting participants for the study. Um, we don't yet have any dancing linguists on there. Uh, we'll go there if we need to to recruit participants, but we're <laughs> we're holding off for now. Anyway, it's been a very exciting project. I, I'm sure Tove can add some things too. Yeah, just to say that Lizzie Hanks is doing such an amazing job, uh, not just on TikTok, but just organizing, managing 
uh, the entire data collection and we're, we're trying to help out as best we can, but it's really her, um, her, um, her baby and <laughs> her work so far. Um, and she, she, she's amazing and she's going to go really far for sure. And it's been such a great, um, collaboration with, with Lancaster too. And, um, we, yeah, really exciting project. We're still, com uh, collecting data. So if people are interested in joining, <laughs> let us know. Um, and, um, yeah, just exciting project for sure. And it's part well, of, as we mentioned, it's a part of a much larger project that the Lancaster team is leading out on collecting the Mauna Kaw corpus of American written English, uh, a bit easier to collect that from a distance. And we're leading <laughs> out on the spoken counterpart here in the States. Uh, when it's finished, we're, we're excited to see what could be done with the corpus and, um, some questions that we will be able to answer by comparing Lana to BNC 2014 that we haven't been able to answer so far. So, well, it sounds really exciting and I, I wish, uh, you both, and of course the rest of your team, uh, all the best with the remainder of the, the data collection and, uh, Yes, um, you you absolutely have my sympathies. Um, it's it's a, a, yeah a, a, a daunting task uh, to say the least, but um, very exciting indeed. Um, we as we come to the end here, um, I I do have uh, some quick questions. Um, in the interests of time, I'm going to uh, ask one of you to answer the first one and the other to answer the second one, and then we'll we'll leave things there. Um, so let's see which way around do I want to do this. Let's go for quick question number one. And I will ask uh, Tove, I think actually you will get this first one. Um, here we go. Are you ready? Quick question. Let's see how quick the answer is. Corpus linguistics, method or theory? Method. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, that was that. I think we set a record. <laughs> <laughs> I can maybe add that we can build toward theory though. So, uh, in different topics yeah. and so on, but, but yeah, method. Okay. Thank you. That was, that was great. Um, <laughs> okay, here we go. Then Jesse, your question is how will corpus linguistics make an impact on the world in the future? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I can't do it in one word, unfortunately. Um, no. I, I think the impact will be huge. I think we've already seen it. Look at, at the last uh, three decades and what corpus linguistics has been able to contribute. At this point, I, corpus linguistics isn't uh, its own subfield as much as it is a methodology that's used by linguists in every subfield of linguistics. And I think that will only continue. We're just scratching the surface of what we can learn. So I think the impact will be uh, will be huge. Brilliant. I like the sound of that. And uh, with that, we will we will bring things to a close. So thank you very much, both uh, for for coming on and um, sharing your 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 thoughts around the role of linguistics and corpus linguistics. And and I think what you're saying absolutely uh, is is worth uh, reminding ourselves of. This is linguistics first, <laughs> and. The methods will vary, but we're all interested in language and that should be at the heart of what we do. Absolutely. So uh, thank you both, uh, Jesse and Tove, for, for, for coming on. Um, that is uh, the end of uh, today's episode of Corpus Cast. So thank you for joining us, our viewers and listeners. However you've accessed us, whether that's here visually on YouTube uh, or if you're just listening to our dulcet tones on Spotify, Google Podcasts, uh, Podcast Addicts, Apple Podcasts, you name them. Uh, we're out there somewhere. Um, in the next episode, uh, we'll be joined by uh, Clyde Ancano and uh, Insa Nolt. Uh, Clyde's from King's College London, uh, Insa Nolt's from the University of Birmingham, to discuss their work uh, in corpus linguistics as applied to research in anthropology, uh, which uh, I'm sure will be really interesting. So do join us for that. In the meantime, um, why not subscribe uh, wherever you're following us, um, and do let us know your thoughts about this and other episodes using the hashtag uh, CorpusCast, of course. What else would it be? And make sure to check out the Aston Corpus Linguistics Research Group on Twitter at Aston Corpus, and you can follow me at LoverMob. Uh, CorpusCast is an Aston Originals podcast uh, hosted by me, Robbie Love, and produced by my excellent colleague, Sam Cook, um, who didn't pay me to say that. Thanks again. Uh, to Jesse Edbert and Toby Larson from Northern Arizona University. It's been such a pleasure to speak to you both. 
thank you for your time and uh see you soon our viewers and listeners on the next episode of, of corpus cast thank you both thanks robbie thank you